Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee to order. It's Wednesday, March 22nd, and uh, we do have a quorum. Um, Senator Marty, you are first on the agenda. Seven, Senate file 1771. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I do have an A1 amendment. I don't know if it's in the packets. Uh, I believe it is in and our I'd, packets, members. And I'd love to incorporate um, on line 4.23, 1.2 million request in fiscal year 2024 instead of 2023. So are you saying we need to make I would just an oral incorporate that amendment. in when offering the A1. Uh, can I have, can Senate Council state that? Oral Thank you, Madam amendment? Chair. Senator, can you restate the number for um, me, please, to answer? Um, Madam Chair, Mr. 1.2 million in fiscal year 2024, because I have a feeling if this is traveling with an omnibus bill, it wouldn't be available before then anyway. Mr. Hidala, can you state what the oral amendment is? Then we can adopt that. Uh, page 4, line 23, uh, before is, insert 1,200,000. And after year, strike 2000, or 2023 and insert 2024. Members, are we all clear on the um, oral amendment to the A1 amendment? Okay. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment, the oral amendment is adopted. And then on your A1 amendment, is that... It's just what I like to, it's just some, a number of little changes in the original draft. Um, so Senator Mann moves the A1 amendment as amended. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? The amendment is adopted. This is um, to get Senator Marty's bill into the shape that he wishes to present it. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. This is a small bill and a study is never very exciting, but I would argue a little bit of background that we have, as you all know, some of the best medical care in the world, best doctors, medical professionals, hospitals, medical technology, research. But we also have perhaps the most dysfunctional system in terms of gaining access to the care. We have unaffordable costs that continue to rise without rhyme or reason in some cases. We have multiple barriers to care, certainly among them are the costs, but also the limited networks, prior authorization requirements, co-pays, et cetera. We've got medical debt. Many countries don't know what you mean by talking about medical debt, but about 40% of Americans, two out of every five Americans, most of whom have health insurance, have medical debt, often more debt than they can ever realistically hope to pay off in their lifetimes. And that lifelong debt is just because they had the misfortune to get sick or injured or something else. We have burnout among medical professionals and workforce shortages related to that. We have the most convoluted, time-consuming and aggravated bureaucratic system, which affects not only patients, but doctors and providers everywhere. We have huge health disparities. Our infant mortality rate for black and indigenous kids is more than double for white kids. We have outcomes that are far worse than we should expect or find acceptable. In your packets, you should have a chart um, talking about how our life expectancy compared to other wealthy countries, our life expectancy is a full four years plus shorter than the next lowest of those countries selected here. And I think you can do that pick other countries in the world, they are wealthy countries, you'll find the same thing. Yet our health spending in the right column is more than double, not only the average of others, but it's actually more than double than per person than any country other than about eight or nine others which spend far less than us. And each of us as legislators, certainly those of you on the Health and Human Services Committee, spend hours year after year wrestling with how to make the system less costly and more accessible and quality for people getting it. Unfortunately, many of those problems are caused by the health system we have. It was not created, it was created through a lot of happenstances, as many of you realize, but it was not focused on, and it still isn't focused on getting care to people when they need it and focus on improving health. 
In fact, many of the reforms we've done over the years have been aimed at saving money. At the same time, we're trying to cover more people, which is why we want to bring down the cost. We're putting barriers to care so people don't overuse care because obviously if something's too expensive, you want to use less of it. So we put these barriers between people and the health care they need. Unfortunately, I would argue that these changes have made the system more bureaucratic and more costly, and those barriers often cost more to implement and carry out than they save in terms of things. So taking a look at the big picture, we would like to try and consider a whole new way of putting together a healthcare system. Same doctor, same professional, same hospital, same everything else, but a new way of accessing it and putting it together. And instead of trying to save money, try and create a system that's based on health, making, keeping people healthy and helping them access health care when they need it. We would call it the Minnesota Health Plan. We have legislation introduced this year. The initial bill is Senate File 2740. And it starts with a number of premises. We would cover everyone with no exceptions. You don't have to qualify. You, you are qualified because you're a human being who needs health care. We'd cover all medical needs, including not just what we think of as medical care, but dental care, mental health, chemical dependency treatment, prescriptions, eye care, everything, all medical needs we'd cover. We figure it should be one where people choose their own doctors and medical professionals and that decisions are made by the patients and their doctors, not by insurance companies or employers or government. It should be the medical provider and the patient making the decisions. And we would have it affordable to all. Instead of premiums the way we do it now, basically based on how sick you are, the proxy we use is your age and your premiums go up as you age. Instead of that, we'd make it affordable to all by having premiums based on ability to pay, ending co-pays and deductibles and other barriers to care. And the obvious thing is, okay, we're gonna cover everybody for all these medical needs. How in the world are we gonna pay for it? And I would suggest that there's economic analysis evidence and real world evidence as well that it actually might cost less to do it this way. Why? Because the elimination of bureaucracy, I can go into how that, but more detail, I don't have time to do that. Fair price negotiations, there have been studies that have shown that some types of surgery and so on, you shop around, which you can't really do for a lot of things, but if you shopped around nationwide, you could find eight to, 16 to one price disparities for some types of surgeries. In Minnesota, it's only eight to one because it's a much smaller pool. Nobody's ever done a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis of what a true universal system would look like compared to what we're spending now. Nobody's ever tried to, but as this chart shows, we're not coming close to what others spend and our outcomes aren't as good. Unlike other studies on healthcare reform, it's not simply looking at the costs of providing benefits. It's looking at the costs of the entire system because there are huge costs of trying to save money by having all these extra reports. It examines all the spending by individuals, by families, by government, by employers. It factors in all the administrative costs of shopping for insurance, of administering it, of picking plans, of telling your employees what they qualify for, what they don't and change in every couple of years. And it doesn't just look at the costs of the current and the proposed system, it would also look at the health impacts on society, how much better we are if we have people healthier and people miss less time at work because they're taken care of. Our approach would bring together aspects of studies that have been done in other states and it's intended to learn from existing research and finalizing design. We would appropriate 1.2 million to the Commissioner of Health and the Health Economics Program there, which would do contracting with researchers and consultants to conduct various parts of the study. We've been working together with the department trying to figure out how the best way to design the study and ensure that the legislation would accurately reflect that need and intent. I think a lot of you would think, maybe everyone thinks that it would cost more to give care to everyone, give everyone access to the care they need. You might think if we do this, it's gonna cost more, but if we continue down the current course, we're putting more barriers into care in order to save money and then we're trying at the same time to break down barriers and help people be able to afford more. That's why I'd argue a comprehensive study is needed. We can't continue the path we're doing. Um, as you know, we're spending more every year and we're fighting to how do we cover more people at the same time the costs keep growing and we're having people who can't get the care they need. So I'm asking for your support for this, I'd argue, thoughtful, thorough approach in an alternative, a doctor and patient centered system that focuses on health instead of cost because ironically, I think 
would actually save money. If you don't believe it would, well, let's have the study. Let's have it figured out. No state has ever done this. I think it's time we do. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator and Marty. Um, I, do have, I do have one testifier signed up, um, Natasha Chernyovsky. Hopefully I didn't get that too. If you could... Welcome to the committee. Please state you. your name for the record and begin your testimony. Wonderful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Natasha Chuniavsky, and I'm the Legislative and Policy Specialist for Citizens Council for Health Freedom. Our organization works on prioritizing um, patient access to care and also affordability of care. And so this is an issue that we feel is very important to discuss. Um, I do have copies of my testimony, too, for the committee, if um, I can hand that out as well. Um, thank you. So um, today I'm here to, to share opposition to SF-1771. And uh, the reason for this is that reports are only funded if there's an intention of um, eventually implementing what is being studied. And we look at a single-payer system as really dangerous to access to care and to affordability and to um, put, um, ability for, for people to receive treatment. And so I want to share three concerns that we see with the universal health care system and respectfully ask that you oppose any form of transitioning Minnesota to a single-payer system. Our first concern is um, access to care. We can simply look at Canada to note the lack of access that individuals have under our universal health care system. I believe that there is testimony in your packets by the Americans for um, Prosperity that references the five month wait time that patients have in Canada currently. Um, and the lack of access to new drugs. Americans have nearly double the access that Canadians do to new and um, developing technology and treatment options. Universal health care would greatly reduce Minnesotans' access to care, which really goes against the goal of what um, Senator Marty shared he would like to accomplish with this system. Our second concern is the immense cost of funding this type of system. Government financed health care will be paid for by Minnesota taxpayers. This is even more concerning when you consider that there will likely be an increase in use or improper use of medical care, such as higher ER visit visits or non-residents coming to Minnesota because we offer care. Universal health care will not increase affordability and as costs increase, um, the accessibility to care will decrease. Our third concern is the limitation of choice. Um, I believe line 2.18 of the um, A1 amendment um, states that the universal health care um, will allow patients to choose their doctors, hospitals, and providers. However, this choice will only be limited to the smaller subset of providers, um, likely even smaller than the current um, availability that, that individuals have for choice today. Um, this will, uh, additionally, a single payer system will lead to implicit and explicit rationing of care. Line 2.17 states that the proposal would cover all necessary care. However, state officials will be the ones determining what um, meets the definition of necessary. And so um, we view, the, view that as an ability for the state to ration care, um, that they would be the ones making the final choice, not the doctor or the patient, as to what they will cover and what they will uh, pay for. Um, we strongly believe that a single-payer system is not the solution to Minnesota's health care costs. A much better option would be to return to real insurance or personalized option. This would allow for um, patients to be paid directly by the insurers and then to direct their dollars towards a greater subset of choice to shop around, as Senator Marty referenced, in order to find the best access to care for the best affordability. Um, and that that option would really be a true reform of the system that will lead to better outcomes, better access to care, and availability um, for all patients. Um, Minnesota should not fund a report that will lead to a government system that will increase the tax burden and harm the patient's access to care. And so thus, I respectfully ask that you um, oppose SF-1771. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for Senator Murray? Sen um, Senator Ebler. Thanks. And I, Senator Marty, I just, uh, just before we get into this, um, there's a, actually a good chance you're going to get your study. You've been working on this for more than a decade. I think there's even a book on it or something. But there's a, at least you could have written a book. I remember we uh, had a forum together a long time ago in Roseville or somewhere. And, um, and so I know what you're getting at. I think we could do better. Um, although Miss, uh, I'm not going to say her name very well, uh, Chernievsky, um, 
this is, if I could have said it so succinctly, I would say this. I think be careful what you're asking for because you might get it. Um, government, I don't think, is wiser when it comes to health care. I think the, for all the benefits that the Affordable Care Act was supposed to bring, for the average Minnesotan, for the average hardware store owner, it got worse. Uh, they're paying up to, and, and you probably could make that part of your speech, they're paying up to $40,000 before they get their first dollar coverage, when before they had a, a reasonable plan from uh, one of the insurers we had. And so under the you know, Affordable Care Act, I'll be polite um, using that term, um, they, uh, the, the companies unethically dumped all the loser uh, proposals, which actually were the ones that were affordable and actually made sense and actually had a, a reasonable uh, loss ratio to help Minnesotans. And so I, we, we agree on, on that entirely. Um, well, I'm just going to echo just one thing and then, but it, it will be interesting to see the analysis uh, just for my own curiosity's sake and the way we're spending money and what's another million dollars and 17 billion. And well, that'll be discussed by more in your other role. Um, but so, uh, just to, this, uh, she did bring up, uh, Ms. Chernavsky, uh, mentioned on line 2.17, cover all necessary care. I want to remind you and the, the, the world that there was a proposal where Oregon was going to, I think they still may be doing that, where they cover, they choose what they're going to pay for and what they're not going to pay for. And we want to be really careful about that. And, and there's, uh, I don't remember the term, but it has to do with your longevity index. And if you're pretty old, you're not going to get stuff. And that's my concern. And uh, so nothing is free. Um, but I just, I just, uh, anyway, just, those are things you thought I would say. And now I've said them. And I'm, I'm very concerned about this. Thank you. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, first of all, Senator Abor, um, I will agree, I wouldn't take Oregon approach. I wouldn't take Affordable Care Act approach. I said that before. The thing. I like it that they cover more people, but I think we have to have a system that makes sense. And our Minnesota Health Plan proposal, which you may have read, you may never have read, but it has not only these specific requirements in it, but the bill itself would require that the system make sure there are enough providers available to, to meet the needs. And in terms of covering necessary care, who determines it? Not the government the doctor and the patient. And that's, oh, then doctors and patients, everybody's going to go hog wild, we're going to get a lot of care. I just want to get, I bet if you ask people in this room, who, many of whom are well covered, almost all of them would say, yeah, if they could get a little more care if they're dental things. And so there are a lot of people in the room that probably would get more care if they could get it. But they can't afford it. But the difference is here, we're saying, it's not that people are going to get all the care they can get. Oh, I want a new knee because I'd like a titanium knee. It's a lot of pain in that. Or, you know, I got free Monday off. I'm going to go get me a colonoscopy. That was so much fun last time. I mean, people don't do that. They want the knee, the care they want. They don't want more care than that. And realistically, realistically, we are going the wrong path when we are having government or employers or insurance companies make those decisions. You as a medical provider know what that is, when the prior authorization for this and that. They don't even see your patients. They don't examine your patients, but they're trying to tell you how to provide care. And the reality is, oh, we're spending more than twice as much. It's all but a handful, literally a handful of countries in the world. We're spending more than two times as much. Maybe we should at least get better outcomes instead of worse outcomes. And so my point is, let's study this. And so I hear your points, but this bill would require the system to have enough providers to do it, which means you can't shortchange the providers. And you're saying it's a free-for-all spending, and my point is all those barriers to care that were designed to save money, they often cost more than it would take to cover people. Senator Adke, did you have a? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Marty, I've got, I've got a few questions. I don't know how many we'll go through, but just some things that caught my eye in, in the bill. And I happen to be on uh, page 3, line 24, but it talks about how this, and it says may, may include areas such as reduced crime. That's one thing that kind of caught my eye. What, how would this affect crime? And if it sure. would, maybe I would 
suggest uh, walking this over to public safety. They need a lot of help on crime right now. So, but anyhow, if I don't, is there's an answer to that. Sure, um, Madam Chair, Senator. Um, last year, I served on the Governor's Justice Reinvestment Commission with Senator Rosen. It was a task force looking at probation and 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 parole, covering people who are out of prison and so on who are offenders. And one of the things we talked about, and we had probation officers and county commissioners from around the state talking about how, you know, one of the problems is people in probation, so on people offenders, how many of them need mental health care or addiction treatment? How many of them need that care? And boy, if we could give it to them right away. I asked, you know, what would happen if we provided, not to everybody else, but just to offenders, provided them mental health and substance use treatment when they needed it? Oh, that would be a game changer. That was unanimous agreement. It would save money, prevent crime if we're doing this up front. But that's the point of it. So this is just to say, no, this is just tell them, look at those things. Out of home placements, you know how much foster care costs? How many of those kids have families that are struggling with addiction or with mental health challenges? You know, if we take care of those things, you don't eliminate the problems, but you can sure take care of them and reduce the problems and reduce the cost to society by doing that. So this is just say, take a look at that, because we never factor that in. But when we had the Justice Task Force last year um, talking about that, oh, that would make a game changer in making our streets safer. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and um, more of a comment here, but our, our testifier had, pre, had, when she was up, had mentioned and brought up the topic of Canada and, and their health care and such. And it was kind of interesting because if I go back um, to one of the jobs I do away from here, uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, and this was just before it was passed into law, I do legal videos. So I was, we were taking a deposition of a uh, a doctor and the attorneys were there and normally it's go time when the attorneys show up and the doctor was someone who had practiced 25 years in Canada prior to coming to the United States to practice and he was telling us why we didn't want what the Affordable Care Act was going to do and some of this uh, single-payer health care that's being proposed here you know being pro the study is to take a look at the possibility of um, and it was interesting because most of the time, as soon as everybody's in a room, we, it's, again, the camera goes on and it's, everything starts. Everybody sat and listened to this doctor because he was talking about what the, it was like to practice and work under that system versus what we have in the United States. And we do have a great health care system. Um, we can argue about the price. It, uh, it is costly. But... At the same time, where I live, uh, closer to North Dakota, we see the major health providers in Fargo and Grand Forks serve a tremendous amount of Canadians. And I believe the Duluth area serves a lot also. They're not coming down just to go on vacation. They're coming here because we've got great health care and they're able to, to get the care they want at the time they want. Um, and that's why I, even looking here, um, going back to the amendment on 3.1, it just, as an example, talks about the capacity, the timeliness, and the appropriateness. I don't believe we move, and again, this is a study, so that isn't changing anything, it's just looking at um, how this all works, but the underlying proposal of where we would like to go with something like this, I believe takes us in the wrong direction because those that are currently living under those conditions are coming to us because they can get the care and such that they need and want. Um, so I just have caution. I know it's a study, but uh, I caution what our underlying objective is to this. And uh, with that, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Mann. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Marty, I hope you get your study. Because what we are currently doing right now is we are trying to plug these gigantic holes in a crumbling dam with little tiny band-aids while the dam continues to just crumble around us, right? Um, and quite frankly, we already know the results of the studies. 
right? We know that it's going to save a whole lot of money because when you take out all the profit-driven entities out of the healthcare system, all of a sudden there's all this money that comes back to patient care. And we know that because we have every, just about every other country in the world as an example. And some do it very well, and some don't do it very well. But again, we have all of those examples to go from. And what they all have in common is that it's significantly cheaper to have universal health care than a for-profit driven market like we do. Now, I found also interesting that our testifier uh, essentially described health care today. All the points that you made were, you described health care today. So for example, wait times. This idea that universal health care will make our wait time significantly larger. Well, right now, we're waiting eight to nine months for neuropsych evaluations. We're waiting three months for cardiology. We're waiting four to six months for rheumatology, neurology, psychiatry. Six months. Um, the cost will be paid by the taxpayers. Who do you think is paying for health care now? Not only is it all of us, the taxpayers, but we are paying significantly more than what we're getting in return. You won't be able to choose your doctor. You cannot choose your doctor today. Your plan gives you a list of people who you can choose from and that's it. And if your plan changes mid-year, you don't get to see your doctor anymore. Rationing of care. This is one of my favorites. Universal health care relief to the rationing of care. We are rationing care today. During the, the peak of COVID, we were choosing who would get a vent and who wouldn't. We were choosing who would get transferred to a higher level of care and who would be left to die. We are rationing care today. And lastly, who makes that final choice about who, what care the patient gets? Under universal health care, it won't be the doctor. Wrong. Under today's health care system, it is not the doctor. Right? I can prescribe you a medication, I can uh, recommend you get a treatment, but it is your insurance company, it is your PBM, it is your formulary who decides if you get that treatment or that medication or not. It's not me. I recommend it. And so all those things that were described as what is happening in healthcare today, and without a complete system overhaul, putting these little tiny band-aids on this crumbling wall is not going to do anything. And so um, thank you for bringing this bill forward, Senator. Thank you. Thank Madam you. Chair, uh, just Senator Marty. in closing, I'll point out, yeah, Senator Utke, I'm glad you point out the language on 3.1. That's why we want to study it to make sure the system capacity, which is better, which covers more people. We have a line 318 study shortage or excess capacity, medical facilities, equipment, and so on. Because you're saying, oh, it's so terrible in those other places. And I'm saying we're not copying somebody else. We're trying to design a system focused on health. One of our requirements for the system would be that you have enough providers to have timely access to care. And in rural communities, we're shutting hospitals under what we've got now. And it's not because the medical need is there. When Mayo closed down Fairmont and sort of shut down Albert Lee hospitals, it wasn't because there was no less need for medical care in those communities. It was because of a business decision they're making. This system would be a total change. But that's why I hope this study will get at some of your concerns and so on, because we want to have a comprehensive study, not one that focuses on one or two things. But thank you, Madam Chair, for your time, and I'd appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Senator Marty. I, I do think this, the study is a valuable um, idea, and I, I think that Senator Mann made the excellent points about um, reasons why today's status quo is not simply not working for us. Um, I see your, on your chart, you know, you have the life expectancy. Um, I'm really concerned because our, the life expectancy in the United States has declined over the past, um, so, you know, 10 years. And we should be really concerned about what is happening um, to cause a, a population level change in life expectancy. So I think the, the ideas behind the study are well thought out, and I um, appreciate your bringing it forward. So we Thank will you. lay the bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. And now um, we'll move to Senate File 2096. Um, I'm going to present the bill for Senator Dibble, Senator Mann, if you could. Oh. Um, that's true. I, I have another bill um, later on, so why don't we move to um, Senator Zhang. Senate file 1490. 
Welcome, welcome back to our committee. And please Hello, go ahead Madam and Chair. present your bill. Um, Madam Chair and committee members, uh, I have before you uh, Senate File 1490. It's a bill that would create uh, management codes for uh, psychiatric care, uh, plus expanding access to uh, psychiatric and mental health care. Uh, mental health conditions are more common than um, what most people think, impacting one in five adults in our country. We're, we're all aware of the increase in mental health care needed for Minnesotans and Americans. Uh, this bill would be a good step in the direction for uh, providing care and more efficient care uh, to those in need. Um, with that, I would like to turn over to my testifier. I think he might be online. Yes, we have um, Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael Trangel, who is going to be testifying by Zoom. And welcome to our committee, Dr. Trangel. Please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I'm uh, Michael Trangel. I'm a psychiatrist and currently a chair of the Minnesota Psychiatric Society's Legislative Committee and also chair of the governor's uh, uh, State Advisory Council on Mental Health. Um, and I don't think I need to go into the fact that we're all aware that the rates of depression and anxiety, deaths of despair, and other mental and actually substance use disorder problems are rising. I want to just sort of tell you a, a little bit about collaborative care and how it works and why it's uh, the most studied and the most uh, uh, evidence-based um, model um, around. If you just think about it, and I'm here, I'm talking as a psychiatrist. Um, you know, if somebody, I wanted to share the state of mind of someone who's really depressed. It's not that they're sad, um, but they know in their gut that things are awful and that they're never gonna get better. And they're, they're, they're struggling with a sense of shame and guilt. In addition to sadness, they don't have their normal energy. Oftentimes they can't sleep. They don't have their normal initiative or motivation or even ability to follow through on things. They try, but it's really a, a biological thing and they just can't do it. Um, if you take that as something, as a model and think about that, um, um, the model that we're talking about, which is collaborative care, um, is based in primary care offices and clinics. You have your primary care doc, that's the head of the team, the clinic hires a care manager, which is typically a bachelor's level person. Um, and you choose someone because they're empathic, compassionate, caring. Um, they, you want them to have a personality style that they have great persistence as well as social skills and they can kind of stick with and support the patient as they're struggling. And then um, you have a psychiatrist who consults to them for about an hour a week when they're doing that consulting, they manage a panel of 80 to 120 uh, patients um, of all different, uh, with all different problems. It could be depression, it could be anxiety disorders. The care manager educates the patient early on and they, the care manager kind of sticks with the patient so that, uh, for example, if the patient is referred to go see a therapist, she, it's usually a she, it could be either, um, but we'll call and say, did you, did you keep the appointment, did you connect, are you in business, do you feel comfortable with the therapist? Um, or in a similar way, if a medication was prescribed, did you get your pills, did you try it, do you have any side effects or any problems? Um, the care manager works with the patient to uh, not just educate, but um, to sort of get them activated again, beginning to socialize again, beginning to maybe exercise. The psychiatrist kind of goes over the patients and runs through the list of patients and helps identify things uh, that come up because we're using evidence-based tools, whether it's a, uh, a standard depression scale or anxiety scale, and kind of pointing out this person isn't sleeping with a darn and it's interfering with things. Let's figure out why that's going on. Are they having too much caffeine? Are they taking a drink at night to fall asleep even though it wakes them up in the middle of the night and they're more tired at the end? Um, and when you do this, when you do this uh, model, the outcomes are much better. Uh, 
you have a much higher percentage of patients reaching remission. You, uh, they get better faster. One of the uh, double-blind control studies shows that, that the average person in collaborative care reaches remission in 86 days versus 614 days under standard care. And a lot of that's because uh, patients have a hard time following through and finishing and problem solving, and a lot of them just don't get better. Um, in addition to that, uh, like I said, you're leveraging psychiatric expertise. If I'm seeing a patient in my office, I might see three patients in an hour. Here I'm sort of influencing, teaching primary care, teaching the care manager and the patient, and I'm dealing with, say, 100 patients on the average for that hour instead of three. Um, the studies show that patients and families and PCPs love it. They're very satisfied, and it saves money. If you're looking at uh, people with panic attacks, um, uh, that are going to collaborative care, they get better faster and they get, uh, their, their anxiety level goes lower and you save $325 per year versus usual care. For depression, if you go out four years, you're saving $29,422 um, compared to people in usual care. And most of those costs aren't paying for the care manager or paying for the psychiatrist. It's paying for medical conditions that patients don't manage as well and don't do as well and they incur within the next few years more medical costs, more admissions, et cetera, because they're just not functioning very well. Um, employers see uh, $1,815 per employee per year if they're treated with collaborative care versus usual care. So I guess what I'm saying is it works. But if you think about it, these savings don't go to the primary care doc or their clinic um, um, the savings go a little bit to the patients and families, depending on what kind of co-pays, deductibles, or insurance they have. But the lion's share of the savings go to the health plans, go to Medicare, or in the, if Minnesota chooses to adopt this uh, for MA as well, instead of just a little bit, right now DHS covers collaborative care in the fringes, in some community, CCBHCs, behavioral health, um, uh, homes, a few places, but not where the bulk of care is given, which is within primary care. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Tringle, if you can complete kind of wrap up. summarize. Yep, thank you. Okay, so anyway, my point is, um, one, uh, this bill mandates that DHS pay for uh, collaborative care in all different settings and everywhere. It, manage, it mandates that they pay for it at, at a sustainable rate which means we don't, how do I want to say this? If you only get MA payment and Medicare payment, typically when you're doing this kind of model, it's not sustainable. You need to get a slightly higher rate than that. And the third part of it is it mandates that DHS, um, when they let out their bids and do RFPs for health plans to bid to do PMAP and cover managed care patients, that all those health plans and DHS need to measure the utilization of collaborative care and increase it by at least 15% to end. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Abler. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Zhang. I, uh, actually, I like your bill. I, Senator Mann, why is it that every time, why, why don't all these companies like notice innovative ways to do stuff better. We have to like make them do it. There's some things we have to make them do or that we ask them to do that are actually going to be more expensive and it's still you know, there's some arguable human value to it all. But it seems like this is something that just looking at the information of it, if you spend a dollar and save a dollar, then you're even. Um, and uh, but this is likely to do better than that. And so on the on the regular health plan side we've talked about adding benefits costs money, uh, sometimes doing things better saves money, and so I, I like where you're going, and you know, I'll be happy to add on to your bill. Um, I'm curious when DHS does their fiscal note that they will, hopefully they'll take into consideration the positive impacts and not just charge you for the outgoing services, which is their routine. For instance, in my profession, when people see me first, they actually save money in the whole back treatment world, like a lot. And, but if we add one more thing to what I do, they charge me for that thing, and they don't take the, 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 re, the reductions in other care necessary. So hopefully when they do that work, that, that's my plea to the department where, in the ether where they are. Thanks. Any other members' questions? 
I don't see any more questions. Um, thank you for bringing the bill forward, um, Senator Zhang. It does seem like a very promising, um, promising model. Um, we would we'd like to mo move this bill to the Commerce Committee, um, and Madam Chair, can I make that motion? Uh, uh, yes, Senator Leibler. So moved. Thanks. Uh, Senator Abler moves that Senate File 1490 um, is recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The bill, uh, the motion prevails. The bill, our Senate File 1490 is passed and referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Thank you, Senator John. Thank you. And now... We are moving to Senator Hoffman, Senate File 1831. Madam Chair, members, thank Senator you. Hoffman. There's a A1 amendment that should simplify the language. You can see that in your... Um, I see there's an A4 amendment. Is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not looking at the right bill. One, two, three, four. I guess, yeah. It's not the first time I've been wrong there. on numbers, it's, Madam Chair. Yeah. Yes, the A1 amendment, uh, Senator Hoffman moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, thank you for hearing Senate File 1831. This bill just seeks to expand coverage for self-measured blood pressure monitoring devices, another acronym for ASMBPs, for the diagnosis and management of hypertension. In the United States, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death and stroke is among the leading cause of the disability with high pressure or hypertension, among the most important factors that are leading to uh, CVD. With nearly half of American adults is estimated to have hypertension, improving the diagnosis, treatment, and control of the condition is critical to preventing heart attacks, strokes, and the development of other serious conditions. Controlling hypertension could prevent more CVD events than any other intervention. One of the most effective tools for hypertension management is the SMBP monitoring devices. SMBP offers reliability and diagnostic accuracy when compared with conventional office blood pressure measurements with the advantage of more measurements over a greater period of time while minimizing the white coat effect. Uh, SMBP is associated with patient empowerment, autonomy, self-efficacy, and lifestyle modification as well as being a cost-effective strategy for lowering blood pressure and increasing medication adherence. This economic benefit extends beyond the patient uh, so included in your packet, there's a document uh, from the CDC that breaks down the economic evidence that's demonstrating the cost benefit for insurers. And Madam Chair, Dr. Hussein, who's the Twin Cities Board President, uh, is here with us. And so I'd like to have Dr. Hussein make some comments. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Hussein. Please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for having me. My name is Haytham Hussein. I'm an assistant prof associate professor of uh, neurology. I'm a stroke uh, specialist at the University of Minnesota. I'm also the member, the uh, president of the American Heart Association uh, Twin Cities and um, a member of the leadership uh, committee developing the Minnesota uh, state plan uh, for cardiovascular disease and, and diabetes known as Minnesota 2030. Um, so I am a stroke neurologist, and stroke is the fifth cause of death in America. Uh, uh, heart disease is the first cause of death, and uh, between the two of them, high blood pressure is the most important risk factor. Uh, so if we have good risk uh, factor control, if we have good blood pressure control, then uh, we can achieve um, longevity and also uh, minimize functional impairment. People with disability from stroke, uh, which is the most common cause of stroke uh, in uh, the United States, especially in the elderly. 
Uh, I want to tell you about a study that I conducted, including uh, about uh, a quarter of a million patients. And we looked at uh, the blood pressure control, and we found that, um, unfortunately, members of racial minorities, black, Hmong, uh, Somali, have worse blood pressure control compared to uh, whites. And also we found that the younger uh, patients have worse blood pressure control than older patients. So the problem starts early in life. And uh, it's more significant in uh, members of racial minorities. Now I'm doing a study with the uh, mobile health clinic of the University of Minnesota. We're going to uh, these health uh, screening events in uh, usually areas of racial uh, minority, high racial minority representation. And we are giving them, once we identify someone with high blood pressure, we give them a home measuring device for their blood pressure. And then we connect them with primary care. And we're studying the efficacy of doing that. We chose this model because studies have shown uh, the efficacy of uh, home blood pressure measuring devices in improving blood pressure control. And uh, it allows us uh, to have, as doctors, to have a better understanding of where most of the time the blood pressure is, instead of having just one reading in the clinic, uh, which might not be reflective of the overall blood pressure. Um, so um, the uh, medical research have uh, shown the benefit of uh, these devices, and in particular for patients of racial minority, it would be much more effective uh, because then it uh, will eliminate um, issues related to access and uh, things like that. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman. Uh, I first would like to point out that we do not have an effective date on when this bill would go into effect. Uh, at least reading through it, I'm not seeing one. So maybe a friendly amendment where we can discuss when you would like this to go into effect um, so that we have that going here forward. And then I do have a couple questions for you after that if we want to talk about that first. Um, Senate Council, do you have a recommendation? Um, Mr. Hadella? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I think the effective date would be August 1st, uh, 2023. If not, um, if there's a particular date you'd like to propose, um, I, I might miss that. Um, Senator Hoffman, did you have an expect? I mean, an May a different expectation? <laughs> No, I, I, yeah, thank you. I mean, usually it goes uh, something like this. It goes enacted after it's, you know, passed or something. But, and if that's the, the date, council, if that's the enacted date, then so be it. That's usually the default, uh, Senator Liskey, that it, that it goes to. But if you think it should move up, heck yeah. I mean, let's move it up. I mean, I, <laughs> Madam Chair? Send it to the floor. Senator Abler. Well, council's talking, but I, I think that has to be a calendar year. And I don't know if it can be done by 24, and if not, then it'd be 25. So that's so all I know. I think council knows more than I do. So. Thank you, Mr. Madam Hedden. Chair, members. Um, I think uh, discussing with other council, January 1st, 2024, to coincide with health plan contracts seems um, like a possible date, if that's amenable to everybody here. Thanks. Um, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I think, uh, like Senator Abler alluded to there, it's going to be really hard to get this in by 2024. Um, so 2025 would be my recommendation. Uh, again, it has to be on that January 1st so that it can go into effect during plan dates. Senator Hoffman? I, Madam Chair, I guess the I don't understand the, the proxemics of 2024 versus 2025. Is there a process problem, do you know, uh, Senator Lusky, or... Uh, What's, what's the concern for moving it to, you guys know better than I do. You, look at I'm looking at a bunch of doctors mm -hmm. up here. Doctor, 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 this is kind of fun. So uh, help me understand that. I'm, I'm amenable in any, any way that, that uh, the committee decides to go with that, so. Do you, um, I'll let 
council have a discussion. Do you Thank you, Mr. Madam Padilla. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, so health plans schedule their contracts on a calendar year basis. So I believe that is why it would start on January 1st as opposed to the standard August 1st or some date in the middle. Thanks. I think we just need to pick one and if we pick 2020. Yeah, well, let's, I think we should pick 2024 and then we'll, if we get more pushback later on that that isn't workable, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> and the bill will be referred to Commerce and that's maybe more in their purview. So, so do you wish to make I will the make the motion then that we uh, make the effective date January 1st, 2024. Do I have and to say that's a friendly motion? Is that the... Um, Mr. Hadella, can you state the, the motion for us to amend them? Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, page three after line 16, uh, insert effective date, Janu uh, let's see. sections one and two uh, shall be effective January 1st, 2024. Members, on that motion to orally amend Senate File 1831, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The oral amendment is adopted. Senator Liskey, did you have other? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for helping me out here, Senator Hoffman, on fixing that. Um, I, this is a very important near and dear subject to my heart. Uh, I, we've talked before, my mom had a stroke at the age of 48. Um, she had controlled high blood pressure, but uh, she also had, unfortunately, ductus arteriosus. Uh, for the doctors here in the room, I'm sure we all know what that means. And unfortunately, a blood clot was thrown and she ended up with a stroke. So strokes are a very big thing in my world. Uh, I've lived through them, seen how they work. And then my dad actually had a heart attack in uh, just 2020. So I've gotten to see both sides of uh, the cardiac world, um, and it's, it's very scary. Um, so. I, I like the bill, uh, the only concerns here, and I'll let Senator Utke take care of the financial discussion, uh, as he's always very good at that. <laughs> um, but I just, I just wanted to tell you, I, I do appreciate the bill, and that's why I thank wanted you. to kind of help you with the, the wording somewhat, so thank There's you. still room, Madam Chair, there's still room to get you on as a co-author there, Senator we'll, Whiskey. So. We'll talk all about all right. that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, Senator Utke, did you? Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I like that. It comes to me without asking, but anyhow. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Senator Hoffman. I do have a couple questions. Your amendment took out some language, and part of my original question was going to be concerning that, but there was a mandate review done on this topic, um, and that brings up the fact that this is a mandate to our health plans to pay out more, and we've seen this uh, platter of mandates growing over the last... Uh, month or two here, and not that this isn't something good, it's just a concern of stacking on the mandates. But anyhow, going back to the fiscal impact and what was um, found or reported in the mandate review, there was pretty substantial costs. Um, and I don't know, uh, Senator Hoffman, if you had a chance to see that, so you, do you know what was in there, or should I we talk the numbers a little bit? Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair and uh, Senator Arke, no, uh, uh, go ahead and, and go through those numbers I, and see what we need to go with this. It, absolutely. Thank you. Senator Arke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, first of all, it was talking about the cost to CGIP, um, mm -hmm. and that's just a reference to, you can, we'll, we'll see what it costs. Anyhow, figuring the partial year, if this was put in mid-year, it was 748000 for 2024. One million five seventy one two twenty for fiscal year two twenty or fiscal year twenty five, and the defrayed cost assessed by Commerce under the ACA is estimated to be at four point four five million the first year, and probably because of what was taken out with the amendment, those numbers are going to adjust some, and so um, it's you're not going to have the answer at this point because it's it's too much at once but mm -hmm. it would be interesting to know when we can and you'll probably get more of this as you move to commerce but uh, um, to know where we land on on that um, number because it is a mandated number those are costs mm -hmm. being picked up but uh, and I know that what was removed 
probably changed that a fair amount. But anyhow, that was going to be a big part of where I was going, but uh, it, it changed uh, here quickly. But so we'll let you uh, move forward. I think that that was most of it. It was just all about that cost, and it was fairly sizable. Senator Hoffman. Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, I think those numbers should go down, but let's, uh, you know, where it's to the next stop, I'll make sure that those uh, folks get those numbers to you, and, and thank you for pointing that out. That's why we have Senator Utke on our committee. It's the fiscal hawk. I like that. Thank you. No, seriously, I, I appreciate those numbers, and, and we'll get those taken care of. But it should go down, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Senator Hoffman, any final comments? No, Madam Chair, I just, you know, to, to know that nearly half of American adults uh, estimated have hypertension tells you something about where we're at in society and is any way we can get to Senator Liskey's point, if this is some way that we can get some prevention or some ideas in there, I, I appreciated uh, Dr. Hussein and his knowledge in bringing this bill forward. So thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you. Um, yes, it does seem like an area that we could generally um, benefit from better um, self-monitoring. So um, with that, um, members, the motion, Senator Hoffman, is to move that Senate file 1831 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. <laughs> is that your motion, Senator Hoffman? So be it, Madam Chair. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Senate file 1831, as amended, um, is passed to and referred to the Committee on Commerce and, and Consumer Protection. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Chair Senator members. Hoffman. Um, and now we have Senator Gustafson. Senator Gustafson has Senate File 1615. Welcome to the committee. I do see uh, you have a an amendment. Um, this has been heard in Human Services. Or I'm sorry. Do you have? <laughs> Do you have an amendment? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe we actually have two amendments. If both of them are up there, um, we I can. Have we have one, and Senate Council has the other to be passed out. Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, I can explain the amendments while they're being passed out, and I'll actually have my testifiers do that if that's okay with you. Yes. Yes, please. Um, Thank you. Ms. Abderholen. Thank um, you, Madam Chair, members. State your name for the record and, and discuss. Um, are you going to be discussing the A4 amendment? Or we have an A4 and an A5. Um, Madam Chair, I'm not sure which number it is, but it's the one that's being passed out right now. Okay. So the A5 amendment. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. Um, this language was, is actually in Senate File 1826, so it has been out there. We spend um, a lot of time and money creating a mental health response to a mental health crisis. And for many of these <coughs> excuse me, situations, families and friends actually could have predicted the crisis they saw those symptoms emerging. Um, but there's nothing they can do if the person won't accept treatment voluntarily um, and if the person does not, you know, is not in danger of hurting themselves or others, there's nothing that we can do. And yet we know that there actually could be something. When we made the changes to the Commitment Act a couple of years ago, we included something called voluntary engagement. And the idea was that families um, or friends could see a symptom emerging, they could call the county pre-petition screening and say, I'm worried about this person. And then we could send out, for example, a peer specialist who could try to work with that person to get them into treatment voluntarily. They could also make sure that they have insurance, that there's a therapist. They could work with the family around means restriction education so that we can reduce the risk of suicide as well. And what we know when we look at homeless outreach workers, that they connect to the person, and the person doesn't agree to housing the first time they meet with them, right? It's usually a couple of times later. And we think the same thing could happen um, in mental health. So you'd have a peer specialist go out and really talk to the person, um, go back over and over, up to 90 days is what's allowed under statute, and try to get them into treatment earlier. We think we could actually reduce um, emergency room use um, and actually people going to jails as well. So um, unfortunately, we made it permissive, of course, for counties to do this, and no one, no one has picked it up. 
So what we'd like to do is fund a pilot project so that we can see what the um, results could be to see if this is really an effective way um, to intervene much, much earlier than we do now. And I would urge your support for the amendment. Members, any questions about the A5 amendment? No? Um, okay, seeing no questions, um, Senator Mann moves the A5 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The, the amendment is adopted. And now do you wish to proceed to present your A4 amendment since this isn't the first stop? Um, can you go through that, please? And do you wish your testifier to, to do that? I think, are you prepared for the A4? We, oh, here we go. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Palin. Please introduce yourself for the record and, and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Ginny Palin with the Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Programs. And Madam Chair and members, the A4 is really um, a bit of a technical amendment. It reflects some feedback from conversations that we have had with the department. Um, it specifies, specifically specifying which staff are included in some of the changes we're wanting to add for some of the estimated costs in the rate reporting, um, adds a reconciliation process to that, clarifies um, and add some structure around the proposal we've had for the behavioral health home rate structure, adds some clarity around effective dates for federal approval, for effective dates when federal approval is needed. Um, it adds some inflation adjusters to some of the proposals. And um, for one of the specific services around crisis residential, our work with Senate Council uncovered that the underlying service wasn't very clearly laid out in statute. And so um, the amendment is clarifying that properly and setting up the payment structure in the proper statute. Thank you. Members, any questions about the A4 amendment? Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Abler. Well, I appreciate uh, amendments being explained. So thank you. This is the bill's second stop, so we are I just appreciate it anyway. performing I think it's, that I think it's a really good policy. Function. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, seeing no questions about the A4 amendment, Senator Mann moves the A4 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. <coughs> Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Gustafson, please move forward with presenting your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate File 1615 is one of a collection of bills that's being brought forward in this session by the Mental Health Legislative Network. It's a network made up of over 80 organizations that advocate for mental health needs. Um, this bill focuses on concrete steps the legislature can take to increase access to intensive mental health services for adults and children in Minnesota. Currently, providers are unable to meet the community need for intensive mental health services. This has resulted in children and adults having no access to hospital level, care, uh, level of care as the only vial, uh, viable option for care. Uh, this trend is overwhelming hospitals, financially straining our state, and most importantly is not the appropriate treatment model for our community members in need of intensive mental health services. Proposals in this bill respond to these challenges by adjusting current policy to enhance provider capacity to staff key services, including establishment of a single streamlined rate structure for behavioral health homes and establishment of an annual inflation adjuster for children's intensive mental health services, allowances for estimated staffing costs investments, as well as capital improvements in determining cost-based rates, coverage of room board costs for residential mental health services to Minnesota care enrollees. I'd like to thank those of you on this committee um, who have joined me as co-authors in this bill, Senators Mann, Hoffman, and Abler. I will now turn to my testifiers to expand a little bit more on the important problem this bill is aiming to solve. And with your permission, Madam Chair, to um, welcome the testifiers in the order you see fit. Thank you. Um, I have Julie Bloom. And um, please state your name for the record and, and provide your testimony. Yes, thank you. My name is Julie Bloom. I'm the CEO at Guild Services. We provide uh, mental health, housing, and employment services in the metro area. 
I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify today in strong support of Senate File 1615 aimed at addressing specific barriers that providers organizations like mine face in increasing access to intensive mental health services. This bill is narrowly targeted on services that operate with cost-based or state-set rates that are structurally challenged to keep pace with service demands, inflationary pressures, and facility improvement needs. These services include psychiatric residential treatment facilities, assertive community treatment, intensive residential treatment services, residential crisis services, and behavioral health homes. My organization provides the, um, the adult intensive mental health services addressed in the bill. Each year, providers go through a rate setting process which is intended to ensure the services break even. The rate setting methodology takes an 18 month retrospective of our actual costs, which is problematic as costs are increasing every year and it's taking longer to fill vacant positions. For example, if in the last 18 months I had turnover in a nursing role that took six months to fill, it appears my costs are much low lower than they will be in the future. This means we have to cash flow the difference into the following year, and it's never just one position. Guild has a much larger budget than many smaller nonprofits, such as many of those who are providing culturally specific services. We can afford to do this, barely, but, I have, um, but it's a huge barrier to entry to providing other services. This combined with the lack of room and board coverage by our state's Minnesota Care Insurance Program, inconsistent uh, coverage, and reimbursement rates from private health plans results in revenues that are simply far be below the cost of providing care. Organizations like mine are struggling, great, struggling greatly to expand capacity at a time when service needs have never been higher. This lack of service capacity is resulting in individuals having to turn to more expensive and currently overly stressed systems um, like hospital-based services. The proposal before you today presents narrowly focused, concrete steps the legislature can take to address these specific barriers. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and I will let you introduce yourself. Please state your name for the record and um, go ahead with your testimony. Okay. Thank you, Chair Wickland and members of the committee. My name is Larry Pajari, and I'm the CEO of Northwood Children's Services. We provide a continuum of mental health care to over 300 children in school-based day treatment, residential treatment, PRTF, group homes, and outpatient services up in Duluth, Minnesota. Thank you for your opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 1615. I am passionate about the PRTF level of care. To do, to do so, we need the critically important provision of a, a, in SF615 to project future costs and build rates required to provide treatment for complex mental health needs. The state of Minnesota got it, got it right when they brought PRTF services to our state. For the past five years, I have seen it firsthand. We are helping hundreds of children have hope that their course in life can be different. PRTF services are physician-directed and team-based. A psychiatrist is part of the treatment planning and engages with our mental health professionals, nurses, direct care counselors. The team monitors medications, assess children after restrictive procedures, and monitors student daily health. Children receive therapy twice a week, group therapy once a week, and regular family therapy. Our children attend school on campus daily with support from Duluth Public Schools. The PRTF 3 to 1 staffing ratio has been a game changer giving staff the ability to support children with challenging behaviors and still pro provide fun activities like skiing, flag football, hikes, basketball, etc. I think we'd all agree fun is important for all kids. Our PF PRTF services serves children like David. Prior to coming, he was sexually and physically abused by his biological parents. Prior to PRTF care, David was described as very moody, having regular outbursts, damaging pro property, and unable to use positive coping skills. David struggled in his adoptive parents' home, leading to failed foster homes, group homes, and hospital stays. David's adoptive parents decided several months into David's treatment with us that they did not want him to come back home. Helping him come to terms with this loss and working toward a group home setting became our new goal. David struggled early on, and he became more act active in activities and getting along with the peers. Suddenly you could see new smiles, and more smiles often led to more success. David continued to work hard on his social skills and got a job in the kitchen and was able to transition to a group home. He is currently attending a high school, maintains a B average, played on the varsity football team, is the manager of the boys' basketball team, and plans to play lacrosse in the spring. David is just one of the many PRTF success stories. This level of treatment support for children includes real challenges. Staff support children through experiences of aggression and suicide ideation on a regular basis. 
a rate setting methodology that takes into consideration needed facility improvements and paying staff a competitive wage is imperative. With Minnesota's mental health crisis combined with our workforce shortage, I am concerned about the ability to provi for providers to continue providing this necessary service. We need a robust continuum of care for children and families. PRTF care is an important piece of this continuum. Trauma is a result of overwhelming sense of danger, powerlessness, and fear. Healing is a result of feeling safe, empowered, and supported. The updates in SF615 will help assure PRTF services can support the children and families with acute mental health needs to heal and live in the community. Our children deserve nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Members, any questions about the bill before us? Uh, seeing no questions, um, Senator Gustafson, I, I appreciate your bringing the bill forward and hearing the testimony. We know that we have a lot of work to do to build up our, our mental health system, and um, this is one part of it. It does seem to have a lot of positive impacts for kids in our state, and um, I appreciate your or bringing it forward. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, we will lay the bill over for possible inclusion in, in a future bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And now we will switch, can I take this? Yeah. Switch over and Senator Mann can chair and I will present Senator Dibble's bill and the two other bills. Thanks. Um, Madam Chair, and, um, I, first I'd like to present Senate File 2096. Uh, this is Senator Dibble's bill. Uh, this would um, exempt, um, establish a program to assist HIV-related drug copay and lab costs for low-income individuals, and it would exempt medications for the prevention of treat prevention or treatment of HIV from medical assistance and Minnesota Care co-payments. Uh, I, I do have two knowledgeable testifiers here, so I'd like to turn to them to provide their testimony on the bill. Um, Dylan Boyer, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Dylan Boyer. I use he, him pronouns. I am the Director of Development at the Aliveness Project, which is a community and wellness center for people who live with HIV. I'm a proud out gay man. I'm a person in recovery from addiction. I'm a proud citizen of the state of Minnesota, and I am a person living with HIV. Before I share my story of struggle and hope, I wanted to read a quote from Elizabeth Glazer, a woman who unknowingly acquired HIV during her, a blood transfusion during her labor with her first child. In 1992, she testified in a room similar to this, quote, I may not survive four more years of leaders who say that they care but do nothing. I am in a race with the clock. And this is not about being a Republican or an independent or a Democrat. It's about the future for each and every one of us. I started out just a mom fighting for the life of her child but along the way, I learned how unfair America can be." End quote. Elizabeth's daughter, Ariel, lost her battle with AIDS in 1988. And Elizabeth lost her own battle with AIDS in 1994, just two years after this speech. 
I'm connected to this story because while Elizabeth was advocating and giving this speech in 1992, my own mother was giving birth to a beautiful baby boy, me. Now, over 30 years later, I find myself in a similar room sharing my story and advocating for some of our most vulnerable community members, people living with HIV. In 2016, I found myself in the depths of a terrible addiction to methamphetamine. I was alone, isolated from my friends and my family and my community. I had no food to eat. I was being evicted from my apartment and I recently discovered that I was diagnosed with HIV. I was scared and life itself was scary. But I knew that I could take a daily medication to still live a long and healthy life. And that was some small glimmer of hope at a very dark time in my life. And despite all of my other struggles, I took this pill here every single day. Thankfully, because of programs like MA and Ryan White Services, this life-saving medication was provided to me at no cost. However, there was this one time that I walked a few blocks to my local pharmacy to pick up my 30-day supply, and there was a $200 copay. This came at such a shock to me because I had never had to pay a copay for my HIV medications before. I had no money, and I could not pay this copay. I went without my HIV medications for two whole weeks. And this gap in medical care can be very dangerous for people living with HIV, especially for folks who are newly diagnosed. Fortunately, I was able to solve this problem with the help of my case manager and quickly got connected back into care. But this is not always the case for every citizen. This is certainly not the case for every citizen that doesn't look like me. This bill will eliminate these kinds of barriers to life-saving medications. No Minnesotan living with HIV should be denied access to critical care and life-saving medications because of a copay. No Minnesotan should have to make a choice between paying a copay for a 30-day supply of life-saving medication or feeding food for their families for the month. I hope that you join me and my colleagues to fight HIV in this state. Thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Boyer. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Mr. Matt Tobrin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Matt Tobrin, he, him, and I'm the executive director of the Aliveness Project, a community center serving people uh, living with HIV uh, throughout the state. Every day, we help people living with HIV navigate complicated healthcare systems to ensure they can access medical care and medications. Access to these medications is critical to ensuring that people living with HIV live long and healthy lives and prevent new diagnoses. Unfortunately, nearly every day, someone in Minnesota learns the news that they have HIV. HIV disproportionately impacts the most underserved communities, and our communities in poverty. This bill addresses a policy glitch in our system of HIV care in Minnesota. Thanks to a federal program called Ryan White, Minnesota operates an AIDS drug assistance program that helps cover the cost of HIV medications and medical care so that cost is not a barrier. This program is incredibly effective at keeping people healthy with incomes between 200% and 400% of the federal poverty guideline. Unfortunately, because of state law, this program cannot help people on Minnesota public health care programs uh, with incomes below 200% because Minnesota has a policy of requiring cost sharing on public health care programs. So this has created a problem where the people with the lowest incomes on, Medi on Medicaid and Minnesota care are paying more for their HIV medications than people with higher incomes. This bill would remove that glitch and remove that cost sharing requirement. Without these changes, the lowest income people living with HIV are forced to choose between food, housing, or their HIV medication. By keeping people healthy, 
we know that it is impossible to transmit HIV to others and end HIV in Minnesota. We appreciate your support for this bill and for increasing the ability to keep people living with HIV healthy and reduce the transmission of HIV. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Toburin. Thank you. Uh, members, questions? Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, as Senator Wickland, um, you, you stepped into this bill. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Uh, if the question is going to catch you off guard or not, but this is just one drug in amongst many that are very important to people, and I'm thinking of heart disease and other things like that. But drugs that those that people buy for those particular reasons, they pay a copay on, correct? Um, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke, I guess I'm not. I'm not someone who is well versed in the whole um, Medicaid Minnesota Care, you know, uh, copay regimen. But um, so I, I don't think I can answer that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yeah, it was being that you were um, picking up and helping out. I, I didn't know if that was a fair question or not. But anyhow, uh, at least from the way I see it, and think the way the system works is those people would have co-pays and once again this is just we, we in a way we pick winners and losers when we eliminate a copay we we add the costs on uh, on on another side and so you know for that reason it it's something that I haven't supported in the past and I would uh, not support again because we I, I, I'm in favor of treating everybody equally, and yes, copays come up, and there's a lot of other very important things we've heard before too. And uh, to pick one over the other is, uh, I don't believe is fair. And uh, even though um, you know today's is testimonies about the uh, their hearings about the HIV drugs, um, there's others that are just as important to other people, and uh, uh, trying to keep that playing field fair. So with that, I, I you know I wouldn't be supporting this bill, but. Thank you to the testifiers for your your testimony here today. And uh, uh, with that, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Madam Chair, uh, I, I just uh, wanted to say I, I do see, you know, in the bill language, it does talk about $3 per brand name, drug prescription, and so on in that paragraph starting at 1.18. Um, I think there is, um, there is a bill that is out there this year, too, to eliminate you know, all of the cost sharing for, you know, Minnesota care or um, for Medicaid Minnesota care. Um, and, you know, maybe that is a better way to go to approach this. <clears throat> but I would say in this specific case, um, as was mentioned, there is a program where people who have, <coughs> excuse me, higher incomes are not paying anything for these drugs. And I think we should try and make it possible for all of the lower income people to, to have the same access, so. Thank you, Senator. Any questions? Um, and I will also add that in our healthcare system, we do pick winners and losers every day, and <coughs> generally the patient is the loser, nine out of 10 times. Um, and so it, I don't think it's also lost on the committee today that this is yet another tiny Band-Aid on our huge crumbling wall that is our health care system. Very necessary Band-Aid, though. So thank you, Senator. Uh, any final comments? Uh, no, I think the, the testimony was um, very, very strong and, and shows why this is an important bill. And I was happy to be able to present it for Senator Dibble. Um, I think removing the barriers to care is uh, absolutely something we should be doing um, in, this, in this area. And um, I hope that we can support the bill this year. Very good. With that, we will be laying over Senate File 2096. And Senator, did you want to go to 2067? Yes, I would like to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.
very quickly that you have an amendment. Um, yes, Madam Chair, I do have the A1 amendment, and is that is that in the packets? It is in our packets. Um, this is a delete everything amendment that I would like to um, move to bring the bill into the shape that I'd like to have it in to present. Very good. Senator Wicklin moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator, to your bill thank, as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate file 2067 is a bill that will uh, would um, carve out um, outpatient prescription drugs from the medical assistance and Minnesota care managed care contracts. Um, DHS would in, instead reimburse these drugs under a fee for, our fee for service program. The bill increases uh, supplemental payments for critical access hospitals, disproportionate share hospitals, and children's hospitals based on measures related to their administration of 340B and high cost drugs, um, and also requires managed care and county based purchasing plans to pay a dif dispensing fee equal to that paid under um, Medi Medicaid for fee for service. Um, this bill um, is meant to address some key needs that um, our pharmacists in um, greater Minnesota are facing. Um, they are facing issues with very, very low um, reimbursement rates for drugs and, um, and dispensing fees. And I have several testifiers who are here to, to talk about the issue and, um, and what this bill would do to address that. And I believe there is a testifier by Zoom. Yes, we have uh, Deborah Leadall on Zoom. And if, yeah. Ms. Leadall, are you there? If you can turn on your video. Can I have her video plug? It's just that cord right there. Good morning. Good morning. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning. My name is Deborah Leadall, and up until a week ago, I was the owner of Temple Drug and Gift in beautiful downtown Elk River. I apologize, this is still a raw situation for me. My pharmacy closed because of low reimbursements and abusive business practices of PBMs or pharmacy benefit managers. It was heartbreaking to make the decision to close a landmark, to stop serving my community, and most likely stop being a pharmacist simply because these middlemen have inserted themselves into my profession and sucked the life out of it. PBMs bring no value to the system. They report record profits while healthcare costs in our country skyrocket. They are making their money off the hard work of pharmacists and pharmacy owners. When I tell people about low reimbursements from PBMs, they often ask if it is simply the downfall of being a small business. But since we aren't able to buy in bulk like the big boxes, that our costs are higher. And I want all of you to know that that is simply not the case. We are often paid below our acquisition costs, even on some of the least expensive medications. A key problem is when PBMs decide to pay little or no dispensing fee, which is a portion of the payment that is supposed to cover the wages of the staff filling and verifying the prescriptions. Five or 10 cents or even 30 cents doesn't cover the input costs to dispense prescriptions safely. This is why a fee for service option is so important. Make no mistake, Low reimbursements are hurting big chains too. They're pushing their staff to fill more prescriptions in less time, sacrificing patient care to increase volume in an attempt to overcome low reimbursement rates, which puts patient safety at risk. When PBM middlemen take away the profitability of small businesses, communities suffer. Oftentimes people think it's important to support small businesses because they are the ones sponsoring the local little league team, but it goes so much further than that. When community pharmacies aren't paid fairly, they are no longer able to provide additional health care services that benefit their communities. Kemper Drug was the first location in Elk River to have COVID vaccines available for community members. We provided vaccines for nearly two weeks before any other pharmacies were ready to do so, ensuring early access for the most at-risk population. In December of last year, Kemper Drug became accredited to provide diabetes education to help patients lower their blood sugars. 
Since the PBMs have pushed us out of business, our community will no longer have access to this valuable program that has been shown to reduce overall healthcare costs and improve quality of life for the participants. Pharmacy owners are asking for an opportunity to get paid a fair amount that allows them to keep their stores open so they can provide quality jobs for their community and continue serving their friends and neighbors. Removing PBMs from state Medicaid programs will not only reduce expenses for the state, but also give community pharmacies a fighting chance. By supporting this bill, you can make a meaningful difference in preserving the profession of pharmacy in Minnesota. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 2067. Thank you, Ms. Lito. Next up, we have Luke Slindy. And can I use the video? Um, is there a way to have his presentation displayed? I don't know what the, the process is. I have the HDMI cord plugged in. All right. There, there we go. go. Thank oh. you. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and just because of the audio issues in the room, I want to make it very clear that last testifier, her pharmacy closed last week. So I want to make sure that that was clear. Good morning, Madam Chair. I am Luke Slendy, a second generation Minnesota pharmacist, and I'm here today to discuss rural community pharmacies, the medical assistance drug program that over 1.4 million Minnesotans use for their pharmacy benefit, and the state's use of for-profit pharmacy benefit managers in that program. I grew up in Harmony, a small town south of Rochester. For many years, my family owned and operated Slendy Pharmacy. Like many Minnesota small towns, it was the only pharmacy in town. However, in 2007, my family decided to sell the business to another local small chain. The primary reason? Abusive and anti-competitive business practices from very powerful for-profit pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, and unsustainably low payment rates. Fast forward to 2022. Increasingly worse conditions caused the new owners of the pharmacy in Harmony to close the business altogether, leaving Harmony without a pharmacy for the first time in over 100 years. Unfortunately, Harmony's circumstance is not unique. Here is a list of Minnesota cities that had a pharmacy in town as of 2006, but currently have none. You may recognize a town on this list in or near your own district. The loss of a rural pharmacy creates significant barriers to healthcare access. Now, let's talk about Medicaid in Minnesota. As of January 2023, approximately 85% or 1.2 million Medicaid beneficiaries receive their pharmacy benefit via a for-profit PBM subcontracted from a managed care organization. For these 1.2 million patients, a pharmacy is paid by and is forced to interact with one of the for-profit PBMs on this list. Fortunately, there is good news. Minnesota has an already existing Medicaid fee-for-service program that currently covers the remaining 15% of beneficiaries, pays pharmacies directly from the state, and treats pharmacies much more reasonably. This chart highlights four key ways the fee-for-service program is better for Minnesota pharmacies compared to for-profit PBMs. One main benefit is transparency. The network contract terms and the payment rates to pharmacies under the fee-for-service program are public information. In contrast to for-profit PBMs, whose network contract terms and opaque maximum allowable cost MAC rates are considered trade secrets and proprietary. Unfortunately, I have learned that in pharmacy, proprietary means we are going to keep this information secret in order to take advantage of everyone who is not us. To reinforce, reinforce this point, prior to submitting a claim to a for-profit PBM, a pharmacy has no idea what the payment rate ultimately will be. Another benefit of the fee-for-service program is the source of payment rates. To determine dispensing payment rates, the fee-for-service program collects cost accounting data from pharmacies themselves to help determine reasonable rates, allowing pharmacies to participate in the payment rate setting process. This cost data separately quantifies the actual acquisition cost of drugs or the price a pharmacy pays to stock each drug on its shelves, as well as the actual cost of dispensing, including staff wages, rent for the building, and other operating costs. Alternatively, the processes for-profit PBMs use to set payment rates is again proprietary and a giant mystery. 
The final benefit of the fee-for-service program I will discuss is the lack of patient steering. Patients under the fee-for-service program may fill their prescriptions at any network pharmacy, while for-profit PBMs often attempt to force a patient to use a mail order or other pharmacy owned by the PBM, creating a lack of patient choice. The coerced use of PBM-owned mail order pharmacies is particularly detrimental to rural pharmacies. In my opinion, the evidence is clear. The existing fee-for-service program is much better for patients, pharmacies, and the state. And many other states agree with me. Here is a list of states that have already removed for-profit PBMs from their Medicaid pharmacy benefit while still retaining managed care organizations for medical coverage and other non-pharmacy benefits. As you can see from this mix of states, this proposal is not a traditional partisan issue, and I will add that our bills in both the House and the Senate have bipartisan support and co-authors from both of the traditional parties. I thank Chair Wickland for authoring this important legislation, and I humbly request you support SF-2067 to remove unnecessary and harmful PBMs from medical assistance, transfer pharmacy coverage for all beneficiaries to the existing fee-for-service program, provide better access to needed patient medi medications, and help preserve the state's rural community pharmacies. And lastly, I would just like to add to all the 340B covered entities, the pharmacists supporting this bill want to work with you to achieve an, a, a plausible outcome. So this bill is about PBMs, and we are happy to work with 340B covered entities. Thank you, committee members, for your time, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. John Hoshin. Hey, good morning. Um, my name is John Hessian. I'm a pharmacist of 34 years and the current owner of St. Paul Corner Drug, located in the McAllister Groveland neighborhood of St. Paul, where I have practiced since 1989. Like most other independent pharmacies, we offer a high-touch, patient-centric level of care with the goal of meeting our patients' needs wherever they are along their health journey. I'm speaking today in support of Senate File 2067 on behalf of all the other independent pharmacies and pharmacists located throughout Minnesota. I know that every one of them wishes they were here to be able to voice their concerns regarding the current state of community pharmacy here and across the United States. I hope to impress upon you the gravity of the matter at hand and what can be done now to avert an already developing health crisis in our state. Over the past six months, my pharmacy filled approximately 4,000 prescriptions under the Minnesota Medicaid program administered by managed care organizations where the prescriptions were paid for by PBMs. That is roughly 10% of my volume. Of those 4,000 prescriptions, 650 of them had a gross revenue of less than $4. 300 of which came in less than $2, with the lowest reimbursement being $0.03 cents for a prescription we dispensed three times over that six-month period. Of the 4,000 prescriptions filled, 1,600 or 40% of the claims had a gross revenue uh, below the current statutory dispensing fee of $10.77 under the fee-for-service program. This fee amount is determined by surveying pharmacies across Minnesota to establish what it actually costs to dispense a prescription. Of these 1,600 prescriptions, we essentially gave the product away free and did not even recover our cost of doing so. 400 of, the, of these 4,000 prescriptions were for brand name drugs ranging in the cost from $200 to $2,400 for a month supply. The total drug inventory cost for these 400 prescriptions was just under $200,000. Uh, nearly 100% of these brand drug claims were reimbursed at or below the actual acquisition cost of the product with no account for any overhead costs such as labor, rent, insurance, licensure, supplies, etc. To my fellas, fellow business owners in the room, when was the last time you purchased $200,000 worth of goods and sold it all below cost? It's absolutely 100% unacceptable, unsustainable, and very, very abusive. If something doesn't change now, more pharmacies will close. We just had one last week, uh, just on the skirts of the metro area, um, including mine. Where will patients go for services? And the answer to that question is not down the street to the chain pharmacy. During September and October of 2022, the closest pharmacy to us had a significant decline in service level due to staffing and other issues. We were taking on anywhere from 10 to 15 new patient transfers per day. By November 1st, we could no longer safely continue to accept additional patients and made the decision to stop taking new prescription patients effective immediately. That policy is still in effect today because we are still beyond capacity, with staff coming in early and staying late to keep up with our workload. Last month, the last Walgreens in North Minneapolis closed its doors along with the area's Aldi grocery store. 
CVS and Walmart have both announced that they are cutting service hours from 9 p.m. to 7 p.m. at nearly two-thirds of their pharmacy locations nationwide. And as, as if that wasn't a big enough blow to North Minneapolis community, yesterday Walmart announced the impending April 21st closure of its Brooklyn Center Supercenter along with the pharmacy inside it. Uh, communities like North Minneapolis and rural areas are home to some of the most vulnerable individuals that rely on the Medicaid program for their health needs. Losing access to pharmacy and food supply creates a whole new kind of social desert and along with it set of challenges for these folks. Many do not have the time during normal business hours or reliable transportation to be able to travel to the nearest pharmacy for services. In short, a health crisis. If nothing changes, there may never be adequate pharmacy services in North Minneapolis again. However, if this bill becomes law, there could be an independent pharmacy in North Minneapolis by the end of this year. This proposed legislation is that, pivotable, that pivotal to the matter at hand. Over the past two decades, we've been told there's nothing the legislature can do regarding reimbursement for pharmacy claims due to Medicare and commercial plan exemptions. That is not the case with Medicaid. The state is already paying adequately for this service, but by the time the money gets to the actual provider, me, there is nothing left. The middleman is taking all the resources and completely decimating the provider network in Minnesota, and it must stop and it can. I implore you to make certain this bill makes its way through the legislative process this session before it is too late, or I fear there may be many areas of Minnesota, both rural and metropolitan, without pharmacy services for a very long time. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hessian. Uh, next up, we'll call Deborah Keveny and Danny Eckert to the table, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Deborah Keveny. I'm a pharmacist and a pharmacy owner of Keveny Drug in Winstead, Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to tell my story. Winstead is a small town. The drugstore is the healthcare heart of the town. We fill prescriptions, we provide education, we do immunizations, and we do testings. We package prescriptions for spe special populations like group homes, nursing homes, and assisted living. We also provide free delivery. Pharmacists complete years of school, mastering the knowledge of medications and their use to treat and eliminate diseases. We become pharmacists to help people and to guide them through their journey towards wellness. We are the most accessible healthcare professional out there. Our patients are in our stores seeking advice and help and frequently get the answers that they need immediately. We see our patients much more frequently than physicians and other providers see their patients. 1.2 million Medicaid patients are farmed out to the managed care organizations who then hire pharmacy benefit managers to administer the prescription benefits. PBM practices drive up health care costs, put barriers between the patient and their medication, and steer patients to their own pharmacies. Minnesota has passed legislation to halt these patient-harming practices with 62W. You all recognize that there's a problem with PBMs, and legislation needed to be passed to stop it. PBMs have proven that they cannot be trusted, and that they continue to, to ignore the laws that have been, pet for, pet, been pet put forth. PBMs are not transparent in their business dealings, nor are they fair. Our payment for many of our medications is below our cost to obtain the drug alone. Our professional dispensing fees are pennies at best. Pharmacies have had to absorb these losses for a long time, but we can no longer find ways to make up the differences. This leaves us with very difficult decisions, as my colleague Deborah Liedahl made this last week. My heart is in my community, but I cannot continue to operate at a loss while the PBM's profit soars at the expense of my patients, my pharmacy, and in this case, my state. I am one person fighting against Fortune 10 companies. This is not a case where the small mom and pop cannot compete with the big guys. This is a case where the big guys are not only allow us to compete with them, we're not permitted. They hold all the cards, and they have their fingers firmly on the scale, tilting it in their direction. This bill levels the playing field for a portion of my business, and it is 100% transparent. There are no hidden fees, the formulary is published, the reimbursement rate is fair, and patients are not displaced. This bill is important to me, to my patients, and I ask for your support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Eckert. Madam Chair, my name is Danny Eckert and I serve as the Director 
of State Government Relations for the Minnesota Hospital Association. Senate File 2067 proposes to transfer Minnesota's managed care uh, Medicaid pharmacy benefit to fee for service. And while it is not explicitly stated in the bill, this would trigger an unintended consequence of removing um, <clears throat> a, a federal rule, sorry, it would trigger a federal rule that will eliminate a significant and sizable amount in annual savings for eligible safety net providers that participate in 340B. Uh, for your reference, I have included a, a fact sheet and an issue brief on this that has more details. It can get uh, kind, of, kind of complicated. But uh, hospitals are critical components of the healthcare safety net in Minnesota, and they use 340B to support numerous patient care services that are otherwise non-reimbursable and to work with community health providers to deliver a wide, wide range of care to patients in need. And without access to 340B discounts and the subsequent savings, it will be more difficult for patients to receive the same level of care from their hospitals and community health providers. Uh, impacting 340B in Minnesota would leave fewer hospitals with needed resources to help pay for uncompensated and unreimbursed care. Although we understand the need to address unchecked pharmaceutical costs, the negative impacts of such costs have on patient care in Minnesota and the need to improve pharmacy benefit in, in, for medical assistance patients. As introduced, Senate File 2067 would indirectly damage existing federal funding for the increased access to care and services at safety net hospitals and other safety net providers across Minnesota. Uh, we support improvements to the community uh, pharmacy, to community pharmacies across Minnesota, as has been evidenced by the testifiers before me, and we want this committee and the legislature to realize that 340B is an asset and has been an asset to the safety net for 30 years, not only in Minnesota, but across the nation. So as such, we really appreciate Chair Wicklund's uh, DE amendment and the recognition of the unintended consequences to 340B and Minnesota safety net providers. At this time, we are still assessing the exact impact of the new language and, it change, and its changes to how the bill as amended impacts 340B for hospitals and other safety net uh, providers. Um, uh, it appears to leave, uh, the, the amendment language does address some of our concerns, but it does leave the other covered entities out, uh, including Ryan White uh, HIV grantees, which we heard from on the bill prior to this. Um, it would, uh, and it was also likely not make 340B hospitals whole. Um, so we, to that, we look forward to working with Chair Wickland, this committee, and the legislature as this bill progresses. We think that there's a, 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 an avail, a available balance to be struck with supporting the community pharmacies while also recognizing the asset that 340B is to the, your constituents and safety net providers across the state. And so I stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Dan Andreessen. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans, uh, Trade Association for Minnesota's nonprofit insurers who are part of the uh, managed care program. Um, we do, um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We, do, we are opposed to Senate File 2067 and, and the carving out of the pharmacy benefit of the state's managed care program. We do recognize that um, there's financial challenges to community pharmacies and I think there is a solution to that in terms of either raising the dispensing fee and raising the capitation rates um, for that. Um, but respectfully, we feel like this bill is is kind of the proverbial using of a um, uh, a cleaver when a, a paring knife would would solve the solution or solve the problem. Um, you know, going forward, I think we need to you know quite you know think about you know what how will the lives of the one million Minnesotans of managed care be improved with this proposal. The managed care model provides several significant benefits to the state, but most importantly improves health outcomes um, because care coordination is done by MCOs, and it's most effective when it extends across all healthcare services. Prescription drugs are a central component of these services, and carving out this benefit will remove vital opportunities to coordinate care. MCOs have invested significantly in their pharmacy areas to support members beyond just tr traditional dispensing of drugs such as the use of pharmacy navigators who directly outreach to our enrollees and assist with their care. In 2019, um, the department did kind of partially carve out this program. Um, in our, all the managed care contracts, we need to adhere to the department's preferred drug list, which is set by the department and their contracted PBM. Um, MA enrollees currently, now currently, the MA enrollees currently receive their medical and pharmacy covers through one entity. 
Um, and so I have a single point of contact to turn to when they have concerns with either of these issues. But by carving out the, ben the pharmacy benefit, enrollees will now have to contact two different entities depending on the services they have questions about. So it would be DHS for pharmacy and MCOs for all of the services. Um, I know there's been a few comments about cost savings. I, you know, I won't go too deep into, into that, but uh, I would just say that that's not settled. Um, there's studies on both sides that show that they're possibly savings, but also possibly cost depending on, on how that's administered. Uh, but there's also studies out there showing that managed care is a cost-effective way uh, for treating those on Medicaid. Um, but again, how will this proposal improve the health of MA enrollees? Uh, because we can't just assume that cost savings is, is, translates into better care. Uh, one example is a few years ago, the state embarked on a preferred incontinence program because of potential cost savings, which did occur, but also resulted in MA enrollees not getting the products and care they needed, which impacted their overall health. We should be focused on enrollee care and member experience first and foremost. And if there are savings, be prescriptive on their use to ensure that we're improving health outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's difficult to improve health outcomes. People don't have access to a pharmacy. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Wicklin, for bringing this. You know, when the question came up about how is this going to affect one million lives, well, here's the thing that I, I, I get. Um, there are 2,205 people that live in Winstead, Minnesota. And I can tell you, Deb, who testified, probably knows about 95% of those people. And, and I can give you a personal example. My mother-in-law, uh, Tess Oleg was her name. Deb, you know the Oleg family. Uh, if it wasn't for the ability to have a personal relationship with a local pharmacist who knows who your mother is or your grandparent, um, there would be lots of people, you know, grinding teeth and, and uh, biting their fingernails because I do not believe for one minute, and when I saw the list, I was back uh, getting educated about uh, some uh, pharmacists uh, as the list came up on the TV screen, and here was an Osseo, uh, downtown Osseo, small little town right there next to Senate District 34. Um, that pharmacist for years had been gone, right? And, and you say, well, who's going to do a better job? And I'm not going to mention any names, but there's a company on 494 in Bloomington, kind of like in your area that you represent. Big, big name. You can see it starts with an E. Um, they were listed in that PBM thing. And then to understand just how the role of the PBMs uh, work, I, I'm really kind of floored that um, we can't get a better service, you know, and I just don't understand why. And, and to have Ms. Kevin, thank you, by the way, for your work in Winstead. Um, which is uh, the good senator from Glencoe and Winstead who's been on the school board for 18 years prior. I just had to get that out there just to try to make you smile, Senator Wicklin. But <laughs> thank you for bringing this bill. On behalf of the, the people I know, not as many as Deb knows, but there's a lot of people I know that are counting on her every day to make sure that their parents and grandparents are getting what's right for them. And this makes sense. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator Abler. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, so I've uh, forever, uh, since I've been here, there's been very great concern about the erosion of the, uh, the local pharmacy. And we've had bill after bill and effort after effort discussing dispensing fees and all that and warning that they're going to go away and like, oh, not to worry. And well, they're going away. And uh, I've, I appreciate the, the value perhaps that the PBMs and whoever brings it to save money for somebody, particularly themselves, it seems like. But, um, but I the disconnect between the the care that's given at a local level and somebody by a mail order is just there's no way to compare, not at all. Some maybe you talk to an out-of-state pharmacist or a clerk or somebody who's going to advise them about something. And we try to pass laws. You have to talk to a pharmacist, and we've done everything we can do. Um, and I appreciate at least the intent of the bill. And if I could just ask, uh, Senator Wicklin, what's your intention? Is this a get the discussion going kind of a bill, or is this something that you're planning to, to move this year? And my discussion will go way different depending upon your answer. So, Senator, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that you know 
some of the concerns about the 340B entities have, we've been discussing how to address that and, and the language is intended to address some of that, but I know that there are entities out there that still have concerns about um, the impact of the language on their um, ability to make use of savings and also to receive some, some reimbursements from the federal government. So I, I think there's more work to be done. I would like to see if there is a way that we can move um, some something forward because you know I, this is a very timely situation for many pharmacies across the state. So um, it seems like it should be a priority for us to not only look at how we're managing costs, but how are we managing um, the the impacts that our decisions have, you know, by empowering um, the managed care organizations to use PBMs. You know, that's, I think, comes back to us to to try to address some of these practices. So, um, so I think it's a combination. Right. And no, we're, sure. I mean, we're planning to lay the bill over today, but, sure. um, but I, I am serious about, I mean, we've heard over my time in the Senate about some of the practices that, are in place um, and the PBMs uh, state that they have to be that way so that they can manage the costs for our programs uh, well enough. But um, what we're seeing is, you know, serious negative impact on patients and businesses across the state. And I think we need to do what we can to address that. Thank you. And Madam Chair. Senator Ebler. Well, I appreciate that answer. And so then, uh, assuming it's, you're trying to get something accomplished and I, Appreciate that, and I'm friendly to the general idea. But I just uh, in section, th I was just trying to figure out how the bill differed from the uh, the base bill. And it's actually there's not a lot of detail in section three where you award the department the power to do pretty much whatever they want. Uh, and maybe that's better than the PBMs and the managed care. Maybe it's not. Um, the department has not always been, you know, ideally responsive and great at what they do sometimes. And so there needs to be transparency. If you're going to do this, there needs to be transparency on their part. And Madam Chair, no one has talked to me about this at all. So I'm just, again, coming off this cold. Nobody is lobbying me for or against. I just know the topic. Um, <clears throat> but if in, you just don't want to jump out of the frying pan into the fire, where the, it says the department can do pretty much anything they want about any drug with anybody. And so if, if you're going to give them authority, I think we want to give them a lane and a process and feedback, um, and so you might that this so section three is kind of short, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. And there's then there's some ways to to backfill some of the expenses, which I appreciate that. And um, I'm not going to query you to understand all this today, but I, but I, you know, I, I think it's it's just too bad. Um, you know, Senator Mann, you know, there's there's not a lot of money being a clinician, but there's a lot of money in healthcare. <laughs> Uh, there's big dollars that exchange hands, uh, massive amounts of money, um, and I think that's especially in the drug side, and it is so invisible to people, and um, th that's the issue. And so, just as we criticize the other part, that's the black box. We don't want to create another black box, and and it, there may be a place to use a PBM for something, and use a managed care plan, and use the fee for service model, and I'm willing to talk to you about that just randomly, but I, I, I think there needs to be better, and we cannot have no pharmacies around Minnesota. Thank you. Any comments? No. Senator Kupik. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'll be quick, because I know we're up against the clock here, but um, I did have a very similar discussion about this with my local pharmacist uh, back in December, because I have, I have some medication, and it's thankfully relatively cheap and a pharmacist told me uh, she gets seven cents on my medication that is what she makes and then and then we had a seven cents uh, and we had a long discussion about she has these medicines that they deliver uh, to around town to seniors who cannot get out uh, especially in the winter time it becomes very difficult and she says we just lose money on those but it's part of what we do for our community and so uh, I would say that our local pharmacies are a vital, vital source of getting that health care out, especially uh, in more rural areas or in particular. But, uh, but even in Moorhead, uh, this is, this is a, a problem and it's a service that they provide. So thank you, Senator Wicklund, for, for bringing this bill forward. 
Thank you, Senator. And the, the almost $30 billion in profits that PBMs make nationally seems very disproportionate to the seven cents that the pharmacies are getting. Uh, we are out of time. Senator mm -hmm. Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be quick. Um, uh, the concerns for our community pharmacies has already been stated, and it's extremely important, um, fully on their side. But as we look at this, we have to remember what was just before us uh, a week or two ago when we had that handout. Pharmaceutical drugs don't go from the manufacturer through the distributor to the pharmacy. There's a lot of other players before that pricing comes back around to know what that final cost is. And those are things we need to... Uh, find answers for or dig into to uh, sort this out. And it's already been mentioned, so I won't say a lot more about it, but it appears that DHS is setting themselves up to become the PBM for the state. And again, I don't believe that helps our pharmacies out there who, who are doing all the work and representing us. So, um, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Wickland, I hope as this moves forward, those conversations can be had because we are all concerned about our local pharmacies. Uh, in Park Rapids, we lost a pharmacy uh, a number of years ago. So to, to find the individually owned and operated pharmacy is a real rare, <coughs> a rarity, and that's not good. Um, so with that, uh, if we can continue the conversation, I'd appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Closing comments, Senator? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I definitely you know, plan to continue discussing this. Um, and to see if we can, you know, avoid, we don't want to Im have negative impacts, but I will continue to work with the parties, you know. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, we will be laying over Senate file 2067. Um, mm -hmm. And members, please do not take away your packets or lose them since there's a bunch of stuff in there for this evening. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned.